for photosynthesis. Photosynthesis uses energy from the sun to change carbon dioxide and water into glucose and oxygen. The balanced simple equation being 6CO2 plus 6H2O makes C6H12O6 plus 6CO2. What's really happening here is the light energy is splitting the water into hydrogen ions and oxygen gas. The carbon dioxide gas will then combine with the hydrogen ions and they will form glucose and water. However, water isn't one of the end products. Now cancelling out the ones that have been used, we are left with oxygen and glucose, which is at the end of the word equation. CO2 plus 6H2O makes C6H12O6 plus 6O2. How plants use the glucose they make? One of the things is for respiration. They use some of the glucose for this. This will release energy so they convert the rest of the glucose into various other useful substances using this energy. Remember that the word equation for respiration is glucose plus oxygen makes carbon dioxide plus water plus energy. So this is what some of the glucose is used for. Another thing the glucose is used for is making cell walls. Glucose is converted into cellulose for making cell walls and this is especially in a rapidly growing plant. Third, glucose is stored in seeds. Glucose is turned into lipids and these are fats and oils and these lipids are for storing in seeds. That's why sunflower seeds for example contain a lot of oil and we use them for cooking oil and margarine. Fourth, glucose is stored as starch. Glucose is turned into starch and stored in roots, stems and leaves, ready for use when photosynthesis isn't happening, for instance at night. Finally, Glucose is used for making proteins. When making proteins, glucose is combined with nitrates, which are collected from the soil, to make amino acids. These amino acids will then be made into proteins, which are used for growth and repair. Back onto the storage idea, starch is good for storing and this is because it's insoluble. This then means that the starch can't dissolve in water and move away from storage areas in the solution, so it's good for storage as it will not move away. And another reason starch is good for storing is because it doesn't affect the water concentration inside cells. Soluble substances would bloat the storage cells by drawing in water. However, starch does not affect the water concentration as it is insoluble. Now on to understanding photosynthesis. Around 350 BC, in ancient Greece, Greek scientists were studying plant growth. They observed the plants and noticed that the only thing touching plants was soil. So they decided that plants must grow and gain mass by taking in minerals from the soil. Air touches plants too, however they couldn't see that. So 
so they therefore assumed and concluded that it must be the soil. Later, in 1648, a man named Jan van Helmont set up an experiment. For this, he dried some soil and weighed it and put it in a pot, in which he then planted a willow tree, which at the time weighed 2.2 kilograms in the soil. He added rainwater to the pot whenever it was dry. Five years later, he removed the tree from the pot and weighed it and it weighed 76.7 kilograms and it gained a lot of mass. However, when he took out the soil and dried it and weighed it, its mass had changed very little. He then concluded that because the weight of the soil had changed so little, the tree must have gained mass from another source, as the weight of the soil hadn't changed. Because he only added water to the tree, he concluded that the tree must have gained mass by taking in water. Today, we know that plants also gain mass using CO2 from the air, but this experiment was important because it introduced the idea that plants don't just gain mass by taking in minerals from the soil. In the early 1770s, Joseph Priestley did an experiment too. He placed a burning candle in a sealed container and observed that the flame went out after a short time. However, he couldn't relight it while it was in the container. He then placed a burning candle and a living plant in the container. The flame went out after a short time, but after a few weeks the candle could be relit within the container. He decided that the burning candle used up something in the air, and that made the flame go out, and that the living plant restored the air so the candle could burn again. Priestley did another experiment. He filled a sealed container with air he had exhale, exhaled. He put a mouse in the container and observed that it only survived a few seconds. He then filled another sealed container with exhaled air and put a living plant in the container and waited a few days. He then put a mouse in the container and this time it survived for several minutes. He thought the mouse couldn't survive for long in the exhaled air because breathing had taken something out of the air and he decided that the plant had restored something in the air, and so this allowed the mouse to live longer. From these experiments, Priestley concluded that plants restore something to the air that burning and breathing take out, and today we know this is oxygen, a product of photosynthesis. Now, more on photosynthesis. Now, in more recent years, scientists have realised that plants release oxygen during photosynthesis which is something Priestley didn't realise. However, they don't know whether the oxygen came from carbon dioxide or water, as both of these contain oxygen atoms. To test this, scientists supplied plants with water containing an isotope of oxygen called oxygen-18. The carbon dioxide the plants received contained ordinary oxygen-16. And so when the plant photosynthesised, it released oxygen-18 and this showed that the oxygen came from the water that was supplied to the plant, oxygen 18, not the carbon dioxide, oxygen 16. There are three limiting factors that control the rate of photosynthesis. First is light. Light provides the energy needed for photosynthesis. So, if the light level is raised, the rate of photosynthesis will increase, but only up to a certain point. This is because up to that point there has been plenty of CO2 and warmth. However, once it reaches a certain point, it won't make any difference how much light there is, because either the temperature or the CO2 level will now be the limiting factor. Another limiting factor is carbon dioxide. As with lighting intensity, the amount of CO2 will only increase the rate of photosynthesis up to a point. After this, the graph flattens out, showing it is no longer the limiting factor. As long as light and CO2, if there's lots of them, then the limiting factor of photosynthesis must be temperature. And so temperature is the final one. And the temperature has to be just right. 
Photosynthesis works best when it's warm, but not too hot. As the temperature increases, so does the rate of photosynthesis. But once it reaches 45 degrees C, it is too hot and the plant's enzymes will denature, and so the rate of photosynthesis rapidly decreases. Usually though, if temperature is the limiting factor, it's because it's too low and things need warming up a bit. So to conclude, the limiting factors on the rate of photosynthesis are light, carbon dioxide and temperature. And that is everything about photosynthesis.